What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE. Big dogs, got it. Eat. And I apologize for those y'all that attempted to watch the video that I put out this morning. You know it's August, so we're putting out videos every single day. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel if you are not already. Uh, the video I put out today was a recording. I go on Matt Kelly's Roto Underworld Radio podcast once a summer. This week was our week. We recorded for about two and a half hours yesterday. Uh, the podcast itself goes up on his podcast, which I will link down below tomorrow. So it'll go live tomorrow, two and a half hours of straight fantasy talk for y'all. Tried to put up the video today and the audio for some reason cut off after 16 minutes. So sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm just fucking sorry to absolutely nobody. Whatever. I'm doing another video for y'all, okay? Because we're not missing days here. We don't miss days in August, okay? It's like the heat. It's like the sun. We don't miss days in August. Today, we're talking about First round picks. And I want to go through the list quickly of the range of outcomes for players in the first round of fantasy football drafts this year. We're going to stick to one quarterback because um, that's more fun. It's more fun talking about running backs, wide receivers, and and, and stuff than, than quarterbacks in the first round. Okay, So we're going to go with skill players. We're going to go down the list rather quickly. And we're going to talk about, I think it's important to go through range of outcomes because a lot of people have this idea of fantasy and fantasy analysis as like black or white. You're either right or you're wrong on a guy. I think the best way to construct a team is to take in different range of outcomes for every single pick that you make, right? Risk with reward, upside and ceiling with floor and downside. And once you put together a team that's well-versed and well-mixed in the mixture of those things, you make a beautiful cocktail of a team that will get you to the chip, that will get you hardware, that has ship chasing aspirations, okay? Um, so I think it's important to, you don't dismiss players outright. You don't specifically target certain players in every draft outright because there's a range of outcomes for all of them. So we want to go through the first 12 players according to underdog ADP. So these are paid drafts, which means the ADP is as sharp as they get. And uh, we're going to talk about their ceiling. We're going to talk about their downside. There's just pros and cons real quickly of the first 12 players. With that being said, let's tuck our shirts in. Stop yelling. And we're not going to do an intro because I don't have time to actually edit this and upload this right now. So we're going straight off the rip. We are just going to talk our faces off for the next 10, 15 minutes, upload it straight to YouTube, and hopefully y'all don't hate it too much. So right now, this is the ADP according to Underdog Fantasy, okay? If you're not already on the Underdog app, I will link it, first link in the description right down below, okay? It'll take you right to the App Store. Use promo code BDGE when you do deposit $10 on there to fuck around and draft and practice or whatever, 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 whatever. BDGE, okay? On underdog, Christian McCaffrey is the 101. I don't need to explain the ceilings. I don't need to explain the floors. Uh, I believe his ceiling is what he did last year. He was averaging 27 fantasy points per game. Okay, that's uh, that's that's league winning. If there's ever been a league winning player in the history of fantasy football, the floor. I mean, if you guys want to argue that he has injury downside, go for it. I am not going to do the case uh, do that. He's not coming off an ACL tear. He's not coming off a torn Achilles. He's not coming off anything like that. No ruptures or anything. So it was a high ankle sprain and then followed by a shoulder strain. So we are not worried about Christian McCaffrey at all. He's a one on one hands down. No questions asked he's done it with good quarterbacks he's done it with bad quarterbacks bad offensive lines good offensive lines it doesn't fucking matter he is the 101 unquestionable even super flex i'm taking him above patrick mahomes 102 dalvin cook uh dalvin cook ceiling is i think dalvin cook can match christian mccaffrey i think dalvin cook brings everything to the field that christian mccaffrey does his ceiling's a little bit lower because i don't think we'll ever see the target totals of you know 120 that christian mccaffrey will get especially with you know curtis samuel out of there now they bring in Terrace Marshall, but he's a rookie, whatever. I don't think the target numbers can ever get as high, but he has as many breakaway plays. He, he plays on all three downs. He gets all the goal line work. He scores a buttload of touchdowns. The one concern I do have, right? Like, I know you guys are going to be like, well, you just said Christian McCaffrey's not an injury concern. But again, we have injury doctors out there, real doctors that do analysis on these players. And Dalvin Cook's, the shoulder, the shoulder separations that Dalvin Cook's continuously uh, gets year over year, those are actually predictive. As soon as you have one of those, the likelihood of it happening again is higher. And he's had it multiple times. So the likelihood of it happening again is even higher than it was. So he keeps missing games with these shoulder strains. There's a good chance that it happens again. So I would say the floor, again, is probably missing a couple games with the shoulder strain. But in terms of just talent playing on the field, we'll assume these guys play the full 
strength of schedule. We'll talk about a guy like Saquon who's already coming into the year injury, but everyone else on this list, I believe, is fully healthy entering uh, the year. So we'll talk about them as if, you know, ceiling and floor just related to their talent, skill set, and opportunity. Dalvin Cook, his ceiling is as high as Christian McCaffrey's, in my opinion. His ceil- uh, his floor is kind of the same as well. We move to Derrick Henry at the 103. This is where things get interesting because if you play in a half PPR or full PPR league, we just saw Derrick Henry rush over 2,000 yards, and I think it was 17 rushing touchdowns, and he was still three, four, five points per game lower than Cook and McCaffrey simply because he does not catch passes. So his ceiling is probably below McCaffrey, Cook, RB3, RB4 in that range if those guys also hit their ceilings, okay? So his ceiling, I don't think he has the RB1 overall ceiling. His floor very high. A lot of people are saying regression, regression, you know, the offensive line, the offensive coordinator, et cetera. Like, dog, they got Julio and they got A.J. Brown on the outside. Like, this defenses are going to have such a problem for Henry. So, Henry, his floor is top three rushing in the NFL. His floor is 12 to 15 rushing touchdowns this year. Guy breaks away 80-yard runs weekly, you know, bi-weekly, whatever the fuck you want to call it, all the time, okay? So, Derrick Henry's floor, I think, is a top five RB at this point. His ceiling is probably RB, RB3, depending on injuries and stuff. He just doesn't have the ceiling that a Christian McCaffrey Dalvin Cook has. Alvin Kamara obviously showed that he had that ceiling last year. He finished as the RB1 overall, okay? So when you talk about elite ceilings, Kamara's got it. I will say, though, that he is riskier this year than I think most people are, I don't want to say giving credit for, whatever the, whatever the opposite of giving credit for is. Because with Alvin Kamara, you have a lot of moving parts, right? He's shown a ceiling the last four years. He's been, I, I want to say, a top 10 fantasy back every single year that he's been in the NFL, top three in three of the four years. Uh, so his ceiling's as high as any any running back. Uh, he does not get the carry totals that McCaffrey does. He does not get the carry totals that Dalvin Cook does. He's always had Drew Brees there. And I'm a little bit worried that because Michael Thomas gets hurt, Michael Thomas gets hurt, which means... New Orleans has no choice but to try to be as creative as possible on offense in order to move the offense, right? Their defense is not good enough in order for them to just run the ball a lot, depend on their defense to win the games and get by, right? Their defense is not good enough to do that, especially not in this division with these offenses. So they're going to have to find creative ways to move the ball down the field, which means a lot of Taysom Hill. And last year with Taysom Hill, Kamara was simply not the same guy that he was without Taysom Hill on the field. Winston on the field, great. Um... Taysom Hill's on the field. That means probably less goal line work. That could mean less catches. I know you guys are saying Michael Thomas is out. That means everything's just going to be funneled through Kamara. Like maybe. I just think the offense overall is not going to be as efficient. And Kamara's made his fucking money scoring touchdowns. So I think while the ceiling, probably not as high as McCaffrey and Cook. uh, But he can definitely be in that RB3, RB2 range. And uh, his floor. Listen, I, I think if he ended up finishing as like a lower end RB1, I really wouldn't be surprised this year. He's as skilled as any running back in the NFL, but the opportunity or the situation is a little bit, I'm a little, I'm a little bit skeptic of the, uh, a little bit skeptical of where we're at right now with Alvin Kamara. Move on to Ezekiel Elliott. I think he's got an elite ceiling. I think with Dak on, on, uh, on the field last year, he was on pace for 90 targets and a shitload of touchdowns and a shitload of touches and I think that's going to be the case this year. The ceiling is very, very high. The offensive line is going to be back and healthy. Dak is back and healthy. The offensive pace is going to be out of control. So the ceiling, I think, is top three running back for sure in fantasy. The floor, I don't really see that being that low because I just don't think Zeke is washed. And I think this offense is going to move so, so, so smoothly. So I see Zeke's floor probably around where Kamara is, probably like maybe not even that low. I would say because his workload is going to be so high and this offense is going to present so many scoring opportunities and touches for him. I, I, I wouldn't put Zeke really that much lower than like RB8 as a floor. So I really, really like him in the first round. Travis Kelsey, ceiling. I mean, he's been fucking tight end one for like five straight years. Two of those years. So the thing with Kelsey is I'm just not picking him in the first round. There's no chance whatsoever I take Kelsey with the first round because last year we're we're going off a little bit of a recency bias here with Kelsey because last year was really the first year that he was worth what the investment would be this year, right? In terms of what he gave you over the next guy at the position, it it was like top running back level stuff. Um, that being said, though, it's not as valuable as a running back because he doesn't put up as many points. It was like 17 points compared to 25 from Dalvin Cook. So the differential in terms of the next guy up uh, on the rankings or whatever, tight end, running back, was around the same, but not the same total number of points. 
That being said, though, the other years when he was a tight end one, there was a year where he averaged like 12 fantasy points per game as a tight end one. Uh, two of the years, he wasn't actually the tight end one in terms of fantasy points per game. So while you look at the total overall career arc for Kelsey, it's been dominant and elite in fantasy, but it's not worth the number six or number seven overall pick. Uh, so ceiling, of course, is the tight end one. Ooh, scared the shit out of me. Woo. Got a call in about eight minutes. We got to wrap this motherfucker up. Um, his ceiling is tight end one. His ceiling is dominating the league again. Uh, but I'm just not on board with uh, picking him in the first round. His floor is super, super high. His floor is probably like the tight end two this year. You know, Kittle could pop off. You never know. Darren Waller could obviously have a 30 fucking percent target share. I don't see him finishing anywhere near outside the top three tight ends. I'd be surprised if he wasn't the overall uh, tight end number one. He's just not, in terms of position and how I want to build my team, he's not going to be the number one overall pick for me. Uh, Tyreek Hill. So we have the upside, we have the ceiling. Okay, so Tyreek Hill, Devontae Adams, Stephon Diggs. Uh, Devontae Adams, this ADP has been slowly creeping up, obviously, since Aaron Rodgers has come back. So Devontae Adams, his ceiling is obviously what we saw last year. It was a dominant, dominant season. It was borderline league winning. We could see that again because the Packers don't add anyone on this wide receiver group. Amari Rodgers is there. He's a rookie. He's a slot guy. He's not going to be taking any of Devontae Adams' targets. So Devontae Adams' ceiling is, again, wide receiver one. Uh, an absolute playmaker and a difference maker in your fantasy lineup. His floor, mm, his floor is fucking ridiculous. Double digit touchdowns, 150 fucking targets again. I think that's the same thing with Stefan Diggs. I honestly think Stefan Diggs has one of the highest floors in fantasy football this year. We saw the number of targets he got. They do bring in Emmanuel Sanders, but I think this offense as a top three scoring offense in the NFL, uh, Diggs has just asserted himself as the top route runner probably in the entire NFL. So I think Diggs, Adams, Hill, Top five wide receivers, uh, pretty much floors. I think all three of them have upside of being the overall number one wide receiver in fantasy. Uh, Devonta Adams probably and Stefan Diggs most likely because the target numbers are going to be in the 155 to 170 range. Whereas Tyree Kill has always been a little bit of a lower volume guy with higher efficiency uh, down the field. There's not really anything else going on there in Kansas City, again, with Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey. So it should be another monster season for both KC guys. I'm not worried about either of them. They did just have a report come out yesterday that Tyreek Hill left practice with knee tendonitis. So that's something to keep an eye on very, very, very closely. This is something that could linger into the season, and that could present a floor where he starts to miss games. Otherwise, I mean, Tyreek Hill is as explosive as he comes. I do think we'll see. I, I think the reason that I would drop him below the other two is because we'll see a little bit of regression in the touchdown category like we're not going to see 15 16 17 touchdowns out of Terry Kill again this year uh, but I think his floor is very safe at like eight nine touchdowns 1500 receiving yards whether or not you want to use a first round pick on that probably not me I'd rather take the upside of uh, some of the running backs that are going a little bit later uh, but Devontae Adams can go off and set records again Stefan Diggs I think could easily end up with 160 170 targets it was his first fucking year in Buffalo uh, so now you have a second year going on. I think the ceiling, again, is probably as high as about Devontae Adams's, and their their floor is probably about the same as well. So it's Devontae Adams, Stephon Diggs, Tyree Kill for me. Saquon, ceiling and floor is where it gets tricky here because we have the ACL tear, obviously. All of the reports are basically that they're kind of easing him into the workload. They're going to take a long-term approach to this. So the floor is this. The floor is that I don't imagine him ever ending up on the pup, but the floor is he's not 100% healthy when the season starts. The floor is that he rushes out there before he's 100% healthy, re-injures himself, or the floor is that he does not get a full workload until week four, five, six into the season. Uh, just not a lot of good juju going out there in New York camp right now. We got Kenny Galladay already banged up. Kadarius Toney was banged up. Saquon's obviously less than 100%. This offensive line has a lot, a lot of improvement to uh, get up on. So I think if you're drafting Saquon, which I've become a little bit more and more hesitant on, you are drafting obviously based on the pure talent of Saquon Barkley. And if there's anyone that can come back from this quickly and be 100%, it is him because he's a fucking freak. So I think the ceiling, I really think the ceiling for Saquon just based on the team build and everything around him with uh, the injuries on the offense already, Daniel Jones at quarterback. And as a mobile quarterback, he tends to throw the ball to the running backs a little bit less and a bad offensive line. Like it's a difference between C-Mac and Saquon Barkley is like 40 targets because you don't have a running quarterback there. So that's the difference between, you know, RB6 and RB1 overall. I mean, we did see what Saquon did in his rookie year, 2,000 yards from scrimmage, okay? They had a much better offensive line. They had Eli Manning throwing him dump off, so I don't think the ceiling is as high. I do think Saquon can get up into that Alvin Kamara type spot where I think his ceiling is probably like RB3 to RB4 for this year, but I'm probably more realistically penciling him in 
uh, as a lower end RB one right now. I think that's probably where you're going to be wanting to draft him. So his floor is definitely lower than the guys that are above him. Austin Eckler, um, this is an interesting one as well. I think Austin Eckler's got RB one overall ceiling. I really do. The issue with him, I mean, he was on pace for 115 targets with Herbert. He's going to take a lot more running work this year. He's one of the most efficient backs. They bring in all pro Corey Lindsley as a center. Uh, they they draft for Sean Slater. They bring in two other linemen. Their offense is going to be explosive. Herbert's coming into his prime, obviously. So this offense is going to move. They're going to be fast-paced. They're going to get him a fuck ton of touches. He's going to catch a fucking 75 screen passes. Um, the problem is what happens on the goal line. I think with Anthony Lynn gone, there's a really good chance that the – at least some of the goal line work. Like when I tell you he got no goal line work, like when Melvin Gordon was there, no goal line work. When last year, just because Josh Kelly and Kalen Balaj weighed more than Austin Eckler, he got no goal line work. So with a different minded, you know, offensive coordinator coming in and head coach coming in, it's possible that, you know, Austin Eckler goes from like 3% of the goal line carries up to 30% of the goal line carries. And that's the difference between two or three rushing touchdowns and six or seven. And if he goes off in his receiving category, right, and he catches 85 passes for 800 yards and six to seven touchdowns, you're looking at a really, really big year from Austin Eckler. So I do think this the ceiling is RB3 overall, RB2 overall for Austin Eckler. It's going to come down to the goal line work. And uh, the reports so far obviously have not been great. They do think that Austin Eckler is probably going to lose a little bit of the goal line work, which is not unexpected. Um, so the floor can kind of drop out to where he ends up scoring five touchdowns, and that's going to be a problem for you with Austin Eckler. I still think he's very much worth the back half of a first-round pick, especially if you're in some type of PPR league because he's going to catch a ton of passes. They're going to be in a ton of scoring opportunities. They love to use him on the wheel route. They love to use him in screen passes, especially in the red zone. So I do expect a lot of scoring coming from that. Same thing with Aaron Jones, man. Been a touchdown machine. Question becomes, see, they again, they don't add anything in the passing game, so Jones should pretty much be the second or third favorite target from Aaron Rodgers behind Devontae Adams. We've seen his ceiling before already. We've seen him score 15, 17 rushing touchdowns in a year, and that was while he was in a committee. They lose Jamal Williams, who was like a pass catching back in this offense, which means more pass catching work. The question becomes what happens on the goal line because A.J. Dillon will probably take a bigger role. Uh, I, I kind of think it's not going to be that much bigger of a split than it was last year with Jamal Williams. Like Jones was a 60 to 65% touch guy. I think we'll probably see around the same split between Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon overall when all is said and done. I do think this means more pass catching work for Aaron Jones, which is obviously a good thing for fantasy. Does it mean he gets less goal line carries? I don't know. They had, they, they're, they're not like a, a backwards thinking team. They didn't feel like they needed to shove goal line carries into Jamal Williams's fucking fat belly just because he's fatter than Aaron Jones. So I don't know if they just necessarily look at AJ Dillon as maybe like down the stretch, fourth quarter, wearing a team down, you know, later on in the year when it's colder, it's winter, it's fucking week six, 14, 12, whatever AJ Dillon time. Maybe that's where it comes into play. I don't think they look at AJ Dillon and say, Hey, we need to get him out on the goal line above Aaron Jones. Cause Aaron Jones has been one of the most, efficient goal line car or goal line back since he's entered the NFL, like in the history of the NFL, to be honest with you. So I don't see that much changing there with Aaron Jones and his touch total upside for Aaron Jones, RB one. He can be in the Christian McCaffrey tier. He can be in the Dalvin cook tier. Do I think it's likely? No, because AJ Dillon, like they, Dalvin cook, Christian McCaffrey, those guys are not competing with a guy like AJ Dillon, second round draft capital, really good speed score. Seen him have good production on the field already. Um, floor, I, I, I think he's got an RB1 floor. I still think he catches 60 passes. I still think he gets at least eight rushing touchdowns, if not more. Really, I mean, they just paid him. He, ju he just fucking secured the bag, and he's going to be a huge part of this offense. You don't pay a guy that much. They could have just let him walk and use A.J. Dillon as a starter if they thought A.J. Dillon was ready for it. They thought he was better than Aaron Jones in any way, shape, or form. He is not, especially not in the shape. Not A.J. Dillon. Not thick, fat A.J. Dillon. He ain't ready for the prime time. Aaron Jones is RB1 overall upside floor, I would say. Low end RB1 just because the touch count might come down in the valuable area of the field, which is the goal line carries. That is what I got for today's video. I'm sorry this was not as well thoroughly done, but I hope you enjoyed and got some value out of it. If you did, make sure you subscribe to thy channel. Make sure you hit the thumbs up button if you enjoy it. Again, I will link underdog. It'll be the first link in the description down below. Uh, use promo code BDGE when you deposit $10. They're going to give you $25 free dollars on top of that to draft with. It is the best place to prepare for your fantasy football drafts this summer. I love y'all. I'm out, and I'll see you tomorrow. Peace.